Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, hope you can see that first slide there. Uh, my name is Sanjay Gandhi. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists here at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And uh, today I'd like to share with you a little bit about the story of kind of the emergence of one of the really exciting fields uh, in interventional cardiology has taken it by fire in fact over the past few years and that's the management of structural heart disease. So just a little bit about what is interventional cardiology. Um, it's a branch of cardiology that involves the catheter based treatment of various cardiovascular pathologies. So basically just using special tubes and wires to treat a variety of different cardiovascular conditions. And uh, you know, what are the goals of interventional cardiologists like myself? Well, our goals are similar, I think, to, to most doctors out there, which are number one, to help our patients feel better, and secondly, to help our patients live longer. Uh, this is a bit of a, bitty a, a busy slide, but it's just really, I just put it in there to kind of reflect all the different types of procedures that we have um, you know, within our armamentarium and in, in, in interventional cardiology and the different types of conditions that we treat. And if you were to look at really the conditions that we treat, I think we can divide what the interventional cardiologist does into three different realms. The coronary realm, which really we're talking specifically about coronary arteries, uh, the structural realm, and the vascular realm. And coronary and structural really are both dealing with the heart. So coronary is specifically the arteries of the heart. Structural heart disease is everything else related to the heart. And then the vascular disease that we treat are really you know, diseases specifically um, that originate in, in the arteries um, and in the veins. So, um, I know we're going to talk about structural heart disease, but I really want to kind of talk about what's been the foundation and what started our field to begin with, and that was the treatment of coronary artery disease. Um, this is just a reminder here, uh, you know, anatomically about regarding the heart. And the aorta is the big artery that comes out of the left ventricle, the big, uh, the main pumping chamber of the heart. And actually the first arteries that come off of the aorta as it comes out of the heart are the coronary arteries. So actually the first branches of the aorta are the coronaries that go back towards the heart because the heart, heart muscle, just like any other tissue or muscle in the body also needs oxygenated blood um, in order to properly function. So this is just a picture of a, of a PAT specimen of the heart. Um, and again, this is the top of the, the right ventricle here. This is the aorta, the big artery that's coming out of the heart. And here we can see the coronary arteries close up. Um, in reality, the diameter of the large portions of the coronary arteries are usually only about three to five millimeters. So really just the size of a thick piece of spaghetti. So this is the uh, anatomy that we're talking about that can really lead to a variety of main you know, heart conditions that we see, such as heart attacks. Um, and when we talk about coronary artery disease, most of what we're talking about are blockages that develop within the arteries. So if we were to look down, kind of down the barrel of a coronary artery, this is what we should see, just kind of a nice uh, open tube with a lot of opening in the middle uh, that lets blood flow through. Um, over time, we can see blockages um, that start to obstruct that lumen or that opening in the artery. And over time, those blockages can be quite severe. And these blockages are kind of really the mainstay of what leads to these symptoms of what we call angina or chest pain. It can certainly lead to heart attacks. And here is again a close up picture of an artery that developed a plaque within it. So this is the kind of open part, and this is the blockage um, that started to accumulate within it. And you can imagine just like, you know, plumbing in a sense, if you start having obstructions that can cut off oxygen to part of the heart muscle that can then lead to chest pain or, or heart attacks. Often with heart attacks, you can have breakages in that plaque that can then lead to blood clots leading ultimately to heart attacks. So this is really kind of the basis of what we do in what we call the cardiac catheterization lab, kind of the, the procedural suite for interventional cardiologists. And when we talk about this procedure called heart catheterization or cardiac catheterization, it's essentially just finding some sort of access to the heart through a blood vessel. So the original cardiac interventions were what we called coronary interventions. And what we would do is essentially um, place tubes or catheters through the femoral artery uh, in the groin and then just navigate that tube all the way up into the aorta up to the heart till we could find the coronary arteries. 
And although traditionally in the past, coronary interventions were done through the femoral artery, most of the time now we can get away with doing coronary um, interventions uh, through the radial artery in the wrist. And the original interventions on the coronaries were what we call a balloon angioplasty, essentially navigating the tube and getting a balloon to where the blockage was and then inflating the balloon to open up the artery. Whereas that was kind of a good initial start to treat coronaries, we found out that we needed um, additional things um, to kind of keep those arteries open. And I've thrown this in just kind of as a, re as a brief history, a reminder of the history of interventional cardiology. The first actual balloon angioplasty, coronary angioplasty was done in 1977 by a gentleman that we consider the father of modern interventional, cardi uh, interventional cardiology, a gentleman named Andreas Grunzig, who was a Swiss cardiologist, did the first coronary angioplasty back in 1977 in Switzerland. Dr. Grunzig later came to the United States and actually started the first interventional program at, at Emory. I throw that in there because Dr. Grunzig's first fellow or dis, you know, a disciple there at Emory um, was Dr. Michael, Grunz, uh, Michael Kutcher, who then came over after completing training with Dr. Grunzig, came over to Winston-Salem and started the interventional program here at Wake Forest. So here at Wake Forest, we're really proud of kind of lend, trading you know, our, our lineage through Dr. Kutcher through Dr. Grunzig. What we found was that in addition to using those balloons, we needed something to kind of some sort of uh, permanent structure to put within the artery to help keep it open. And so that's kind of where these idea of stents came through. And stents essentially are these little metal springs. Um, and they're really tiny little springs. Remember, we're talking about things that we need to fit into the size of a thick piece of spaghetti um, that were developed to put inside the coronaries. And this is kind of how stents work. Basically, those little springs are folded onto uh, with uh, a balloon on the inside. Um, we feed the balloon and stent to the blockage. Then we open up the stent by inflating the balloon. And then we deflate the balloon and the, balloon, and the stent is pretty much permanently in place. And here is a little cartoon kind of showing that. So here's the blockage. Here's the stent with the balloon going in. The balloon's being inflated, stent's inflated. The balloon is now deflated and the stent is permanently in place. We would draw the catheter and the balloon that was there. So that's really the essence of what we talk about stents in coronaries. And that pretty much covers all the other types of different type of interventions that we've developed kind of on that essential concept. When we're in the cath lab, we're using x-rays to kind of look and see where our catheters or tubes are. So here's an example of what we call coronary angiography. So the catheter is placed inside, in this example here, the left main coronary artery. We inject x-ray dye into the artery and we can kind of track what the blood flow is through the arteries. In this individual here, this patient had a heart attack. So you can see that there's x-ray dye or contrast is going down the artery, but it stops right here. And this kind of sudden termination right here um, represents basically a sudden blockage in the artery. So in this case, we were able to place a wire all the way through the artery. You can see the balloon being inflated in the artery right here where the blockage was. And after we inflated the balloon, you can see that that x-ray dye now is not stopping here, but goes all the way here to the rest of the artery. This x-ray dye represents blood flowing to the end point of the artery. And then here's what it looks like after the stent is finally in place. And so this is kind of, you know, kind of the bread and butter of, of what, what I do often, which is stopping heart attacks. And this is how we can stop heart attacks kind of in their midst. Now, again, I brought up coronary disease because that really is the foundation for treatment of other types of cardiac conditions. Remember, structural heart disease is any disease of the heart aside from coronary disease. So with the same idea, we are now using catheters or tubes really to treat other diseases of the heart. And again, looking kind of at the, at the heart anatomy, um, when we talk about structural heart disease, we're talking about any disease of the chambers of the heart or the valves of the heart, et cetera. Um, today, I wanna to talk about two specific you know, uh, disease processes that we treat um, in interventional cardiology, and that's aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation. And kind of remembering again, looking at the heart's anatomy, the heart's, you know, 
you've got the right atrium and the right ventricle on the right side of the heart, kind of the top and bottom chamber, and then kind of the correlating uh, top and bottom chambers on the left side of the heart are the left, vent left atrium and the left ventricle. And then you've got the four heart valves that correspond with those chambers as well. So the aortic valve is the heart valve between the main pump and chamber of the heart, the left ventricle, and the aorta, the big artery that's coming out of the heart. And the main purpose of the, of the aortic valve is to basically regulate this flow that's coming out of the heart to the rest of the body. And so with every heartbeat, um, you know, the aortic valve opens and then closes to make sure that the blood continues to go in one direction. So with a healthy aortic valve, the valve typically is made up of three opening, three different parts called leaflets. Um, and this is what the valve looks like if you're kind of looking at it from above when the valve leaflets are completely closed. And then when it opens with the heartbeat, that's, this is what it should look like. So there should be a nice big orifice to let that blood flow through. So one of the more common con you know, valve conditions of the heart that we see is something called aortic stenosis or narrowing of the aortic valve. And over time, what can happen uh, most commonly is that you can have calcium that builds on those valve leaflets. And as if you have calcium that builds on those valve leaflets, it makes it harder for the valve both to open and to close. And you can imagine if you need a big wide open tube to let blood flow out to the rest of your body. And instead, this opening goes from something like this to something like this at peak opening, what a lot of stress that puts on the heart. So over time, that's, the heart really has to work really, really hard to get the blood, you know, to get, get the body the blood flow that it needs. And as a result of that, we can see, you know, um, certain heart, heart conditions with aortic stenosis. And there's kind of a classic triad of symptoms and heart disease states that are associated with aortic stenosis, um, which are angina, syncope, and heart failure. So angina is chest pain, syncope, or passing out episodes. And then ultimately you can develop what's called congestive heart failure. So basically just weakening of the heart muscle to the point where you've got symptoms such as shortness of breath, uh, swelling everywhere, you know, difficulty breathing when you lie flat, um, kind of the end stage of a lot of different cardiac diseases. And it's been shown, and we got pretty good data that shows that this can correlate to your prognosis, um, these symptoms. The most common end stage symptoms that we see, you know, a disease state that we see with really bad, severe aortic stenosis is heart failure. And typically once patients start to develop congestive heart failure with aortic stenosis, their survival becomes less than two years. Fortunately, um, we've had a very, very effective treatment for aortic stenosis. But the only real effective treatment is a new heart valve itself. So this is meant typically what we call surgical aortic valve replacement um, for aortic stenosis. Um, this has been a big, you know, this procedure, as you can imagine, is a, is a big surgical procedure. Um, it involves going under general anesthesia. The surgeon has to make a large incision in the chest wall. Here's an, you know, a photo taken from one such surgery. Um, the chest wall has to be opened up. Um, basically, the heart has to be, you know, the uh, patient has to go on what we call bypass. Um, the heart has to be stopped. And then that old valve has to be cut out and the new valve has to go in. And as you can see, again, a, a big procedure, a lot of tubes going in and out, um, a lot of delicacy to it as well. So the good news is, although it's a big operation, it's a very effective operation. Um, these here is just an example of some of the heart valves that have been used in the past. Um, for heart valve replacement. And these can vary from a variety of different types of uh, cow tissue as well as uh, pig tissue valves. Um, and then also what we call mechanical valves. So mechanical valves that don't have any biological material either. So again, you know, a wide variety of different types of valves that have been used for aortic valve replacement. And surgical aortic valve replacement, I think is one of the most remarkable treatments that we have in modern medicine. Um, you know, essentially people you know, who have aortic stenosis and bad aortic stenosis have an expected survival of two years with medical therapy. This is a classic study that showed that those same patients basically who got a new valve um, compared to patients who didn't get a valve, okay, were living, you know, over 80% of those patients were still alive out at five years. So a pretty remarkable therapy. The one thing though I think you can appreciate though is that it is a big operation. So although many patients do well, um, 
it's a pa it's a procedure that maybe patients, you know, uh, very elderly patients, 80 years old or, or older, um, or with a lot of other medical problems, potentially could have a lot of you know, challenges with in the recovery phase. So because of that dilemma, you know, we've got a therapy, these patients need a new valve, but the therapy for them to get this new valve it can often be pretty daunting and can involve a, a you know, high risk of complications. Is there any other way that we can get these patients that heart valve that they need? And that's kind of where really the birth of modern uh, structural treatments for structural heart disease in the cath lab was developed. Again, kind of looking at it from the simplistic view of interventional cardiology, you know, we love to open up blockages. We'd love to put in stents. Why not put a valve inside a stent and deliver it with a catheter? And that's exactly what was done and started several years ago. So here's an example really of the first um, stent valve that was used uh, for a catheter um, using the same concept that we use for coronary disease, which is basically find an access point to the heart. Um, usually that is the femoral artery, but sometimes it can use be other arteries, for example, um, the subclavian artery under the collar. And then once we get that access point, just put in a folded valve extend that all the way to the heart and then just implant a new valve. The big difference here is, and we don't take out the old valve, we just simply implant the new valve inside the old valve and the new valve takes over. And here's again, a cartoon of kind of how that works. All right, so if this is the aortic valve right here, we go in with a valve uh, made of either pig tissue or cow tissue that is implanted. Uh, I don't know if they're not calling about one here. All right, so that's implanted inside the valve right inside your own valve and then basically a balloon is used to inflate the new stent valve the balloon is deflated and the new stent valve is permanently there taking over here is uh, just like dr grenzig was the uh, pioneer of uh, interventional cardiology i think we can credit a french cardiologist dr elaine cribier with really kind of being the father of the transcatheter procedure or the transcatheter aortic valve replacement or TAVR procedure. And here's Dr. Cribier with his first patient, really the first patient who successfully underwent the TAVR um, many years ago. Now that's, this procedure was initially started out as this kind of an experimental procedure reserved for a small number of patients who couldn't undergo surgery has now really expanded multiple fold and has now really become a, a, a the standard uh, therapy for many patients who need a valve replacement. In the United States, We've got two options for the types of valves that we can use. One is the, the balloon expandable valve that I showed you here. And the other is another type of valve that basically expands on its own once we kind of unsheath it. And this is what it looks like when we're doing the procedure in the cath lab. So just imagine this is actually where the aortic valve is right here. We use a balloon first to kind of just stretch that valve a little bit. Okay, and then we actually implant the valve. And here's the valve, what it looks like that's in real time as we're implanting the valve. And then that's what we leave behind. So that's the balloon expandable valve. The other type of valve we have is the one that inflates on its own or expands on its own. Um, this is called the core valve. Um, and essentially we've got this valve in place. We kind of gently start to let it, we un what we call unsheath the stent portion as the stent's expanded, it expands completely. And this is what it looks like in real time. All right, so that's the aortic valve. With the last couple of minutes that I have left, I wanna talk about the other valve or one of the other valves that we can treat in the cath lab, and that's the mitral valve. Um, and the specific condition I'm talking about here is mitral regurgitation or leaking of the heart valve. So the mitral valve, remember, is the valve between the left atrium and the left uh, ventricle. It controls blood flow from the atrium into the ventricle itself. Um, the problem that we can often see with the mitral valve is that it can start to deform, and as it deforms, it doesn't close completely. So this is the opposite problem. It's not that it has a problem opening, it has a problem closing. And if it doesn't close properly, often there could be leaking within the heart. And if it leaks within the heart, it starts to backflow into the lungs and cause congestion. So similarly, and this is kind of what the mitral valve looks like from above. It's kind of like a fish mouth. There's two pieces, leaflets that open and close. Traditionally, there's been surgery to replace the valve or fix the valve. And that's also a very successful surgery, but like in, with the aortic valve surgery, we often have a problem with really sick patients uh, who may not be able to tolerate the actual procedure itself. 
So based on that, we've developed something called the mitral clip. And the mitral clip is based on one of the surgical treatments for the mitral valve, um, where the surgeon basically puts a clip or a staple to connect the two leaflets together. So in the cath lab, we can do the same thing We're using a catheter um, and with this device here called the mitral clip. And essentially what we would do is we go in through the vein and the groin up into the right atrium. We actually then make a hole going from the right atrium to the left atrium. And then we go to the mitral valve and we do approach the mitral valve. We open up the clip, we get below the leaflets of the valve and basically then close the clip and kind of create that same effect um, with the valve there as well. And here's an example of what, often we have to put more than one clip, what the clips look like on x-ray. And here's an example of a patient who underwent, underwent a valve replacement. Um, this is an ultrasound that shows all the color here is the leaking that occurs with the mitral regurgitation. Once we place a clip, there's the clip right there. You can compare it. You can see that all that leaking has gone away. So a couple of quick examples there of the mitral clip as well. So I want to close there. Hopefully we'll have a couple of minutes for questions here. Um, in conclusion, transcatheter therapies are emerging as an important and successful therapy for structural heart disease. Techniques and technologies continue to be developed and refined, which means great news for our patients, patients living longer and patients feeling better. Thanks so much for your attention and be happy to take any questions here. It looks like the first one